Um, about a week ago, John McCain was in Minnesota. You might have seen this interaction with one of his supporters um, who said in one of his town hall meetings, I've read about him talking about Obama. Um, he's an Arab. And McCain responded, no ma'am, he's a decent family man, a citizen. Now, this was the culmination of a week of people shouting things like terrorist or kill him in the audience. And when John McCain said this, he was hailed by the media for finally taking on someone who was saying something, what was perceived as negative. Now, think about this, what this person said. I've read about him, he's an Arab. And what John McCain responded, no ma'am, he's a decent family man, he's a citizen. Now, put your own religious group or um, ethnicity in there. Uh, I've read about him, he's a Jew, no ma'am, he's a decent family man, he's a citizen. I've read about him, he's a Christian. No, ma'am, he's a decent family man. He's a citizen. We have come to accept the vilification of a whole people. We had on our broadcast uh, Isabel McDonald from FAIR, Fairness and Accuracy Reporting, that just put out a report called Smear Casters. They are the broadcasters who spew hate. It is so important we have a media that builds bridges between communities. That's the power of independent media, allowing people to speak for themselves and when they can't tell their own stories, perhaps because it's after 9-11 and you've had thousands of men, Arab American, Muslim, people of South Asian descent rounded up in this country, many of them deported. We didn't know the charges against them. They didn't know the charges. We didn't know their names. And that's what's happened in this America because there are two Americas. For some, the greatest democracy on earth. No question about it. But for others, it's a very frightening place. And we need a media that reflects this, that reflects all the worlds that people live in, so that people can speak for themselves and we can build bridges between communities, not advocate the bombing of bridges. I come originally from Pacifica Radio. I don't know how many of you know Pacifica, but it was founded almost 60 years ago in Berkeley, California, by a war resistor named Lou Hill. When he came out of the detention camps, he said there's got to be a media outlet that is not run by corporations that profit from war, but run by journalists and artists, and that's how Pacifica was born. George Gerbner, who is the former dean at the Annenberg School at University of Pennsylvania, the School of Communications, said we've got to have a media that's not brought to you by corporations that have nothing to tell and everything to sell that are raising our children today. So the first station went on the air, KPFA, in 1949. The second, KPFK, in Los Angeles, in 1959. My station in New York, WBAI, in 1960. Uh, WPFW in Washington in 77. KPFT in Houston went on the air in 1970. KPFT is an interesting station in Houston. It's the only radio station in the country whose transmitter was blown up in its first year of operation. 1970, it goes on the air. And the Klan straps dynamite to the base of the transmitter and blows it to smithereens. I don't think it was their intention that they would take this small, little notice station and blow it into the consciousness of the people of Houston, but they certainly <laughs> did that. And I can't remember if it was the Grand Dragon or the Exalted Cyclops, because I often confuse their titles. But he said it was his proudest act. And I think that's because he understood how dangerous Pacifica is. Dangerous because it allows people to speak for themselves. And when you hear someone speaking from their own experience, whether it's a Palestinian child or an Israeli mother, an Afghan grandfather or an Iraqi aunt or a Venezuelan cousin or a kid from the South Bronx or right here in Memphis. You say, it sounds like my baby, it sounds like my papa, my mother, my father. That's a media that is authentic, 
that is honest, that builds community. We need a media that is a sanctuary of dissent. That's what will save this country, dissent. Pacifica, Paul Robeson, when he was whitelisted from almost every public space in this country, but a few black churches knew he could be heard over the airwaves of Pacifica Radio, the great uh, the great actor, singer, scholar, athlete, Paul Robeson. Um, Fanny Lou Hamer, Pacifica Radio has the largest collection of the audio recordings of Fanny Lou Hamer. James Baldwin debating Malcolm X, where could this be heard? But in a place that doesn't major in nine second sound bites. What can be said in that amount of time? And what a disservice to the young people of this country when that is now the average length of a sound bite. How are you going to hear someone learn how someone critically thinks, thinks outside the box? Among our most popular shows are when we simply run a speech of someone for the hour. Now that goes against all the MTV accepted wisdom that kids especially cannot focus for more than eight or nine seconds. We have an extremely expanding young audience for Democracy Now! Kids love to hear people think outside of what they usually hear on television. To hear someone start somewhere and end up in a very different place, you have to be able to take that journey with them. What can you say in eight seconds? You could say, Saddam Hussein is like Hitler, and everyone knows what you mean. And you said it in four seconds, and you're ready for prime time. But if you have something else to say, perhaps that the Bush administration might be guilty of war crimes. Now, actually, that took less than eight seconds, but you sound a little crazy. What do you mean war crimes? You gotta explain the Nuremberg Principles, the Geneva Conventions, what is a war crime, and that takes more time. And they say it's not a political edit, you're just not quite ready for prime time. We need a media that gives space to discuss the most important issues of the day. I see the media like a huge kitchen table that stretches across the globe, that we all sit around and debate and discuss the most important issues of the day. War and peace, life and death. And anything less than that is a disservice to the servicemen and women of this country. They can't have these debates on military bases. They rely on us and civilian society to decide whether they will kill or be killed to decide whether they will go off to war. Anything less than that is a disservice to a democratic society. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever gotten to hear or see Democracy Now. How many of you listen to Democracy Now? Now, do you listen on satellite television? How many of you listen on satellite? Watch on. Uh, on link, you watch on DirecTV, channel 375 is Link TV. On Dish Network, we're on channel 9415 Free Speech TV and on 9410 Link TV. Online, we're at democracynow.org, where video and audio streaming, our transcripts are also there. How many of you have been to our website and seen and also read the show? Well, we are now on over 750 stations around the country. We began in 1996 as the only daily election show in public broadcasting on a few dozen community radio stations. Right around September 11th, we expanded to television to one public access TV station in New York, Manhattan Neighborhood Network, and then the show just took off. Uh, public access stations in other cities would say, can you send us the broadcast, and then the radio station in a town where we were on television would say, can we run you? And then we went from Pacifica and community and low power FM stations to NPR and PBS stations, and now we're on over 750. I think folks are passing around this flyer, um, and you can pass it around and give it to your friends. You can ask your local public television and radio station to air Democracy Now!, WYPL, um, 89.3, TV18, Mid-South uh, Public Radio, KNO, KNP, you could even try WEBL. Um, it matters that we link together all over this country. The power that has 
to provide a forum for people to debate and discuss the most important issues of the day is absolutely critical, especially in this year. And this year is really only the beginning. Now, I did just come from the Democratic and Republican conventions. We expanded to two hours a day for these two weeks. Our broadcast was called Breaking with Convention, War, Peace, and the Presidency, from the streets to the suites to the convention floor. In Denver, I started in on Sunday night. Monday was the first day of the convention over at uh, Mile High Station because there was a big party being thrown there by AT&T. Um, it's very important to understand what these conventions are about. They're supposed to be celebrations of democracy. They are huge corporate extravaganzas. And they're particularly alarming when it comes to the many young legislators who come from all over this country, or new legislators, who are learning. It's really a socialization process for them. And they end up spending most of their time at parties sponsored by corporations with lobbyists who want something from them, who want legislation. And it's our job to show all of that. Um, you know that if you give money to a candidate or to a party, um, it's all there. You go to opensecrets.org and that's how as it should be. That's how a democracy should work. But when it comes to the conventions, it doesn't work that way. There's a loophole in the FEC, Federal Elections Commission, that um, if you're giving money to the host committee, to the host city, that's the roost, that's what they can hide behind, Denver for the Democrats, St. Paul for the Republicans, you, it doesn't have to be declared then. So these corporations can give millions, they gave over $100 million. And it has to be declared 60 days after the end of the convention, which takes us right to election day, when it doesn't really matter as much. So the key for journalists is to go to these places and see who the legislators are hobnobbing with, who your elected officials are being feted by. So I went first to the AT&T party um, and was met by Mile High Security. Um, and they said, no, no journalists allowed. I said, wait, but these are elected officials who are going in. We should be able to see um, why AT&T is throwing this party. Well, we knew pretty much it was just a few weeks before at the beginning of the summer. Um, the Democrats had joined with the Republicans in granting retroactive immunity to the telecoms like AT&T and Verizon, these companies that were illegally spying on the American people. It was pretty astounding. You might remember months before, it was on Barack Obama's website, a statement from um, his Senate office that he would never support retroactive immunity. He not only supported it, he said he would filibuster it. He not only supported it, he voted for it, and many Democrats did. And soon after that, it was right before the convention, um, the uh, delegates' bags, the prototype came out for the bag, and these are the thousands of bags that are given out, swag bags filled with corporate goodies, you know, for the delegates and for the media, and the AT&T logo was plastered right over the Democrats' dele the Democratic delegate bags. Now, their convention was at the Pepsi Center, not to be outdone, Coca-Cola was on both sides of the Republican delegates' bags. Um, and our, our, uh, our credentials um, hung from a lanyard that said Quest. And at the Democratic Convention, our actual credentials were in a plastic uh, protector that said Vail Resorts. It's our job, whatever the party, not to be a party to the parties, but show you what's going on. Uh, we had some trouble doing that, um, but managed to get around security when we could. And then we were headed to St. Paul. And we arrived at the airport. John Stewart was on our plane, so we went to interview him in baggage claim. And right as we were interviewing him, I got a text, and it said, um, there's a house being raided in St. Paul. Eyewitness video is being arrested. And I said, what? We raced off to this house. Now, eyewitness video is very well known in New York. They're the collective who in 2004 at the Republican National Convention, you know, when 1,800 people were arrested in New York, swept off the streets and held illegally for more than 24, more than 48, some more than 72 hours, a lot, most of them released after President Bush spoke on the Thursday night of that week and kept in huge warehouses on the piers. Um, 
Well, everyone knows who eyewitness video is because they collected the videotape of the police actions as they rounded up people. And um, with all of these arrests, of course, there came many lawsuits. And when these cases went to court and the police would say they behaved in a certain way, the video would tell another story. And it cost us, the taxpayers, millions upon millions of dollars because so many people won their lawsuits because they were wrongfully, illegally arrested. And even when the police had videotape, eyewitness videotape, eyewitness video showed the full video, not the edited version. And the judges got really mad. And scores, hundreds of people were included in these lawsuits. So we know who eyewitness video is. They're among the first to be targeted at St. Paul. They've come in to monitor police behavior. And they're at a house in St. Paul. They had just arrived. We raced over there. The police had already moved in. They were all being held in the backyard. They were uh, handcuffed. One of our producers, Elizabeth Press, had been with them that day. She was right there. First, the FBI had come, the federal authorities. Um, the authorities came with AR. 15 uh, automatic weapons with guns drawn when they moved in on these videographers. Elizabeth was so scared as she was filming that they would mistake her camera for a gun that she put it on her head and they're all taken out in the backyard. All the press is kept in the front across the street until the family next door. Um, the mother comes out. She's really mad, an African-American woman, and she says to the press, Hey, come through my house. You've got to see what they're doing to my neighbors. Because these people were renting the house next door or were being housed next door. So we ran through her house and in the backyard when we were with all of her kids and we were looking over and now we could see it and we could film and we could. And a lawyer came back from the National Lawyers Guild. She said she represented the owner of the house who was one of those who was handcuffed, who didn't even necessarily know the people who were staying next door. And uh, I said, oh, he owns the property. She said, yes. I said, can I interview him? She said, sure. So I jumped the fence with my cameraman, and the police started to push me hard back and uh, told the cameraman, he better get out of here. Should I? He said, I can't. She's my boss. I am only following orders. She'll fire me. And he said to the cop, he said to the cop, you know what I mean. I'm only following orders. Um, so but once the press was there filming what was happening, they had to stop the whole thing, and the people were released. They were detained for hours, but then at that point they were released. That's the power when the media shows a spotlight in the right direction. Reminds me of going to Nigeria 10 years ago. Um, I went with my colleague, Jeremy Skakel. We were just together last night at the Wisconsin Book Festival. You know, he wrote the book Blackwater Rise of the World's Most Powerful Mercenary Army. It's a great book, really frame the debate around these mercenary companies, a very important book. But Jeremy and I went to Nigeria, the Africa's most populous country, in the summer of 1998, 10 years ago, to investigate what oil companies were doing in the Niger Delta. Um, I had been wanting to go to Nigeria for about three years since a man came into our studio at WBAI in New York, who I had never met before, I hadn't heard of before. Um, a Nigerian activist brought him in. He was also Nigerian. His name was Ken Sarobiwa. He had come to the United States to talk about what was happening to his people, the Agoni people. He was a great playwright in Nigeria. But he decided to put all that aside, to go home to Agoni land, because their shell corporation crisscrossed the land with oil pipelines in a way that we would never allow in the United States above ground. They flared off the oil from fires that were larger than apartment buildings. These kids never knew a dark night growing up in the shadow of the flame. Yet these communities were so disempowered as these large oil companies were drawing power from their land, further disempowering them and giving them to the most powerful countries on earth, the oil to places like the United States. As Ken came into our studio, we had a book show, but they had just walked in. He said, could we have two minutes? I said, well, we, I'm sorry, sir, but we actually, we don't have any time. Uh, and we said, well, he had just come from Nigeria. Okay, two minutes, come in quickly before the next guest. And as he talked, we bumped one guest after another. 
until he became the whole show. As he said, I'm a marked man. He was taking on the powerful oil interests, in this case Shell, working together with the dictatorship in Nigeria, uh, Sonny Abacha. And so you had this powerful corporate military government nexus. And he said, if I go back, I will be arrested. And sure enough, Ken Sarawiwa went home. He was arrested. He was held, put before a kangaroo court. And on December 10, 1995, he was executed with eight other minority rights activists. And so I finally got to go to Nigeria in 1998. I visited his parents in Agoni land. They've since both passed. Remarkable as they and his brother continued the struggle to make the world aware of the price they pay for oil. And I'm not talking about the price of a barrel of oil here. It's another color when they're talking about it. It's the color of blood. And it's so important we understand how much pain oil causes in other places in the world. And so we went to another area of the Niger Delta called Elijah Land. We had heard not Shell, but Chevron um, had been drilling and there was an oil spill and the community just a few months before we came was simply asking Chevron, went to the barge offshore to ask them to clean up yet another oil spill that was polluting their mangrove forests and killing the animals and the fish and asking for jobs. And they went to the barge and they wanted to negotiate with the Americans in charge because they felt that would be the only thing that would stick. And as they stayed on the bar barge waiting, uh, they saw Chevron fly in the Nigerian military and they landed on the barge and they disgorged the military, notorious. And they opened fire on the villagers and they killed two of them, critically wounded a third, rounded the others up brought them to the notorious Nigerian jails where some of them were tortured. And so we brought this story back to the United States and did a documentary called Drilling and Killing Chevron and Nigeria's Oil Dictatorship. And I just got a call before coming here back at the hotel uh, from the lawyers in San Francisco they are bringing the case to court. The judge has agreed to hear it on October 27th. They are suing Chevron, one of the largest oil companies in this country, right here on U.S. soil for the killings of the Elijah villagers. Chevron couldn't get away. couldn't get away with killing protesters in front of their headquarters in California, of course not, but the reason they can get away with doing this in the Niger Delta is because the spotlight is not focused there. That's why we need an independent media to focus it where it matters. It's our responsibility as journalists to go to where the silence is. So back to St. Paul as we were filming what was going on in the backyard and ultimately Eyewitness Collective was freed. What the police were engaged in was a preemptive raid. Um, we know this term um, from you know Tom Cruise's movie Minority Report. I don't usually recommend Tom Cruise's movies, but <laughs> this one is pretty instructive. You know, he's getting arrested for pre-crimes. That's what was going on here. And it was happening all over. In fact, a few days before, the police went after the Glass Bead Collective, another video collective who'd come in from New York. They were coming from the Greyhound station. They immediately went after them, took their video cameras, took their computers. Now, the reason they were well known, this is just a few weeks ago. Do you remember the YouTube video that so many people saw of the policeman uh, body slamming the cyclist. It was this summer um, and knocking him off, uh, knocking the cyclist off the bicycle. That was the collective that put up that video. They knew who they were and they went after them. These are very serious times and this is what we were facing um, at the Republican convention. So on Monday, the first day of the convention, there was a big peace march in the morning. 
I mean, what you saw on the corporate networks was so different from what we broadcast on Democracy Now. People called and said, are you in the same city? Because thousands of people were marching outside. Over 10,000 people marched the first morning on Monday of the Republican Convention for peace. Let's not forget, most people are against war and for peace in this country. You wouldn't know it if you watch television, but the fact is, most Americans are opposed to torture. Most Americans are opposed to war. You are not a fringe minority. You are not a silent majority, but the silenced majority, silenced by the corporate media, which is why we have to take it back. The media are the most powerful institutions on Earth, more powerful than any bomb, more powerful than any missile. And the Pentagon's deployed the media, and we have to take it back. It's not good for the generals. It's not good for the low-level soldiers. It's not good for a democratic society. So on Monday, this protest happens in the morning. Over 10,000 people are marching from the capital of St. Paul, marching toward the Excel Energy Center. Oh, great, the Pepsi Center was the Democrats. The Excel Energy Center was where the Republican Convention took place. Excel Energy paid a million dollars to both the Democrats and the Republicans to advocate for nuclear power. They didn't need to. They both advocate for it anyway. But um, So they marched in the morning. And very touching as it was led by Iraq veterans against the war, all these soldiers in uniform who were saying no to the war, saying no to other young people being sent to the place that they had just come back from. So many wounded warriors. I mean the ones that make it back, not even the ones that don't. Um, and that was a powerful image in the morning. And then the afternoon I went off to the convention floor to interview delegates from the hottest state, from Alaska. And, um, uh, and I was talking to people there, and I got a call on my cell phone. You know, uh, you know, having this iPhone, which is very problematic, by the way, even trying to get into that AT&T party, this wasn't even enough of a pass. I don't know why. Um, maybe they knew how much I complained about it. But um, so I get a call on my cell phone. It's from one of our producers, Mike Burke. He says, Sharif Abukadusa and Nicole Salazar, Sharif and Nicole have just been arrested. I said, what are you talking about? I thought they were in the office digitizing tape in St. Paul. We were working out of St. Paul Neighborhood Network, which is the public access station we broadcast on. He said, well, uh, they'd gone out, there was more protest in the afternoon. They went out to cover it. So I heard that they were arrested and that they were hurt. So I raced from the convention floor with our cameraman, Rick Rowley of Big Noise Films. We're racing through the streets of St. Paul to 7th and Jackson, where they said that they were. And there I saw this lineup of the riot police all in their new combat gear, you know, top to bottom, covered in black. Um, and they had fully contained the area. When I was running from the convention floor, I came up, I don't know how many of you have seen this video, 49 second video of me, of my arrest. Uh, and someone said, you really have to show the context, which I deeply believe in. You have to show what happened before. It's not fair to just show right at that moment where you rest. I said, there is no context. That was the second I got there. I ran up to the police. It was just a line of police. And I said, um, uh, I'm an accredited journalist. I said who I was. Uh, and you could see the, my credentials were dangling around my neck. I even had my corporate lanyard on, and, uh, and I said, I, I, am a, I am an accredited journalist. I've just come from the convention floor. Two of our reporters, our producers inside, they're also accredited journalists. I want to make sure that they're released. Can I speak to your commanding officer? And they ripped me through the line. They, <clears throat> they ripped me through the line. They twisted my arms behind my back. They slapped those rigid plastic handcuffs on that um, dig into your wrist. And they pushed me up against the wall and put me on the ground. I mean, this was within seconds. Uh, I demanded to see Nicole and Sharif, because uh, I heard they were hurt. I couldn't see with my video. It looked like a war zone in this parking lot, by the way. Uh, there was a, uh, a young protester who was on the ground, handcuffed and throwing up another one, head bandaged. You could not believe what this looked like. There was Sharif across the parking lot, and he was standing there, his arms behind his back, handcuffed, his credentials around his neck, and he, he was bleeding from the arm. Finally, they brought me over to him, and I was proclaiming loudly, we are journalists, you have to release us, you can see we're accredited journalists. 
And so the Secret Service came over and ripped the credentials from around my neck. Um, at that point, um, I was charged with a misdemeanor interfering with a peace officer, with a peace officer, if only they had acted as peace officers. <clears throat> and I was ultimately put in the police wagon and there was Nicole. And Nicole told me what happened. They had been in the office, they heard a commotion downstairs, they ran down with their camera, they were filming, the riot police moved in in a pincer-like move. Uh, they were in the parking lot, they're moving very fast. Um, and Nicole did not plan to film her own violent arrest, but this is exactly what happened. She's holding the camera, they're coming at her, they're saying, face in the ground, face in the ground. And she's shouting back, press, press. She's holding up her credential with one hand and she's holding the camera with the other. And they take her down behind, between the cars. Um, they've got her down, face in the ground, knee or boot in her back, and they're dragging on her legs so it's bloodying her face. And what's one of the first things to do is pull the battery out of her camera if there was any question about what they wanted to happen there. It was very clear who all of us were. You know, my credentials, you know, I run from the convention floor, and these guys know exactly what these credentials are. They allow me to speak to presidents and vice presidents and senators and congressmen. That's why we're allowed on the convention floor. So they knew exactly what they were doing. Sharif is right by her. We try to go out in twos. And he is telling the police to calm down. They throw him up against the wall, they kick him twice in the chest, they take him down, they cut his arm, it's bleeding, and they handcuff him. That's what happened to our team. So we're taken off, the, I'm taken to the police garage where the protest cages are, and Sharif and Nicole are taken to jail. They're facing PC felony riot charges, that's probable cause felony riot charges. Who was rioting? You know, the way Nicole was taken down, you really would hope there was a police officer around. Here's this young woman who's taken down by these armed men between two cars. You hope maybe there would be a police officer in the house, right? Well, the problem was the police were the assailants. You want a policeman to arrest the assailants, but the police are the assailants and they're arresting their victim. But overall, the victim is democracy. Because journalists are the eyes and ears of the democracy. And when those eyes and ears are compromised or shut down, democracy is threatened. There's a reason why our profession, journalism, is the only one explicitly protected by the US Constitution, because we're supposed to be the check and balance on power. We're supposed to be holding those in power accountable. Ironically, we were just blocks from St. Paul City Hall. We're one of the last remaining, one of the last um, remaining typeset copies of the uh, Bill of Rights was housed and they were showcasing it for the week. The next day, a major protest, people are walking down the street and they're tear gassed. They're walking by the monument outside the Capitol that says, blessed are the peacemakers. <clears throat> this went on all week. So, we are taken off to jail and I'm to the, at the protest cages, but there was such a tremendous outcry over our arrests that ultimately, I didn't know when we were inside, but ultimately we were released that night. So I was invited by the networks to come, people wanted to interview me, so I was back at the convention center in one of the sky boxes telling the story, an NBC uh, reporter was right next door doing his stand-up. And he's listening to my story, he says, and then, uh, when I finished, she said, I don't get it. I mean, like, I've covered 300 protests, and I mean, I didn't get arrested here. I said, oh, were you outside? And he said, well, no. <laughs> so I said, well, I'm not getting arrested in the skybox either, or on the convention floor. But like, as Woody Allen says, 90% of life is just showing up. I mean, first you have to get out there. You know, these celebrations of democracy, it's not just what's being said on the convention floor, the carefully crafted message from the floor. Democracy is a messy thing. It's the words inside and outside, and that's our job, is to bridge all of these worlds. Um, so the next morning, the police chief of St. Paul, John Harrington, holds a news conference, so it's my job to go cover the news conference. So I go in, and the officer who processed me the night before is the one who's opening the door um, to the press conference. I said, you not only have to let me in, you have to let me out. <laughs> so I go to the police chief and raise my hand and describe what happened to us. 
and describe how Nicole and Sharif were hurt and ask, what have you instructed your police to do? What kind of atmosphere are you creating here? How do you expect us to operate? And he said, you can embed with a mobile field force. You can embed with the police mobile field force. Embed. You know what he means by embed. You know, reporters embedded in the front lines of troops in Iraq, which I think has brought the media to an all-time low in this country. Because when you are covering the people you're sleeping with, eating with, whose life, your life is in their hands, they are protecting you. How do you think you're going to cover them? If you're going to embed there, what about embedding in Iraqi hospitals, in Iraqi communities, in the peace movement around the world to understand the full effects of war? And now that model is being used and being offered up as the way we cover American cities. That is not acceptable. So a couple weeks later, they just well, two weeks ago, they've announced that they dropped the charges against us. They arrested more than 40 journalists that week. It is not only a violation of us personally, not only a violation of freedom of the press, which is very, very important. It is a violation of your right to know, the public's right to know. How do you find out what's happening? How do you get the information to decide how you want to be, what you want to do, how you want to act. I mean, the media are so powerful right now. They're the way we understand the world. If we don't know someone personally, for example, from another country, and they're the way the world comes to understand us. And it has to be done through something other than a corporate lens. Think about how we are projected to the rest of the world right now. Think about it. I think the most famous image that Americans would have of the invasion of Iraq, hard to believe, five years ago, the five and a half years ago, probably the picture of Saddam Hussein going down, remember the statue in Firdos Square, because it went down, we saw it thousands of times on television, right outside the frame of the U.S. Marines pulling him down with that rope. So it's going up and down, up and down, you saw it everywhere. But I dare say the image of the rest of the world of the invasion is probably an Iraqi prisoner with a bag over his head, standing with his arms out, Christ-like figure electrodes dangling from his, in, from his fingertips, standing on a box. How is it that we have come to represent torture to the rest of the world? How, how could it be? Or extraordinary rendition, and it's White House for kidnapping. You know what extraordinary rendition is. It's when uh, people are swept off the streets or somewhere and they're sent to a country that the United States knows tortures. For example, Maher Arar. Well, my brother David and I have written three books and then our second book, Static, uh, we wrote about Maher. Well, our first book is called Exception to the Rulers. That's the motto of democracy now. It should be the motto of all the media. That's what we're supposed to be, the exception to the rulers. Our second book is called Static, because in this high-tech digital age with high-definition television and digital radio, all we get is static. That veil of distortion and lies and misrepresentations and half-truths that obscure reality. Well, what we need is the media to give us the dictionary definition of static. Criticism, opposition, unwanted interference. We need a media that covers power, not covers for power. We need a media that is the fourth estate, not for the state. And we need a media that covers the movements that create static and make history. And <laughs> in that book, we begin with the story of Maher Arar, a Canadian citizen who was born in Syria, fled Syria, never served in the military. And he got married, living in Canada with his two kids, and he's coming back from a family vacation at a few days ahead of his family, and he's transiting through JFK up to Canada, not planning to leave the airport, and U.S. authorities take him off at JFK, imprison him for about 10 days, and then they send him off to Syria. They're saying words like he's a terrorist. And he's saying, whatever you think I am, then send me back to Canada. Let them put me in jail. Let them try me or keep me here. Don't send me to Syria. I will be tortured there. He said, I didn't serve in the military. I fled. I will be tortured. And they sent him there. He wept all the way there. 
And when he got there, sure enough, they kept him in a grave-like cell for 10 months and 10 days. They interrogated him. They tortured him. They abused him. And as inexplicably as he was taken, he was released almost a year later and sent back a broken man to Canada. The Canadian government did a full investigation, fully exonerated him. And the Bush ally, Prime Minister of Canada, Stephen Harper, held a news conference, awarded him $10 million and castigated his own ally, President Bush. Not only did the U.S. not apologize, but keep him on a terrorist watch list in this country. He has sued the U.S. government now. That is what extraordinary rendition is. How is it that we have come to represent torture and kidnapping? How could this improve our national security? It only compromises it. Because imagine if a U.S. citizen, if a U.S. official, if a U.S. soldier is captured somewhere and his captors say, we'll do it the American way. It matters what we represent. We are so much better than this. It's also why this year is so important. It's so important for all that we have come to represent, but all that we can represent to the rest of the world. Being here in Memphis is always a very moving experience for me, being that it was 40 years ago. April 4th, 1968, that Dr. King was killed, and such an honor to be here with the keepers of the memory. Um, the National Civil Rights Museum is such a moving place. I recommend everyone go there before you leave here. Um, you are right there. Uh, you are in the room where Dr. King was, where he, uh, on the balcony, where he breathed, breathed his last breath. Uh, I write a column every week uh, that's syndicated, and you can ask your local newspaper to run it. And I've written a couple of columns coming here to Memphis on Dr. King, his message, stop the war, help the poor, 40 years ago, not now. But he might as well be standing on that balcony giving these speeches today. And you look at how the press covered him when he was giving his speech a year to the day before he was assassinated, April 4th, 1967, at Riverside Church. His why I oppose the Vietnam War speech, the Beyond Vietnam speech, and the kinds of statements he made. He said, a few years ago, there was a shining moment. It seemed as if there was a real promise of hope for the poor, both black and white, through the poverty program. Then came the buildup in Vietnam, and I watched this program broken and eviscerated. So I was increasingly compelled to see the war as an enemy of the poor. He went on, I'm convinced that if we are to get on the right side of the world revolution, we as a nation must undergo a radical revolution of values. And they moved in on him quickly, right? The fire tap, the FBI wiretaps continued. J. Edgar Hoover described the Nobel Peace Prize winner as an instrument in the hands of subversive forces, of subversive forces. But he continued to speak and particularly in those last years, to speak out against war. Something that is not emphasized as much in the eight-second sound bites when we sometimes remember King, when the media brings us those eight-second sound bites of I Have a Dream. He had well more than a dream through his life. He had a practice. He was a strategist. He was taking on and bringing together the issues of militarism, of racism, of classism, talking about poverty and talking about war, talking about the poor and talking about war, and making those connections. At Ebenezer Church in Atlanta, April 30th, 1967, Dr. King included the press in his critique. He said, I knew that I could never again raise my voice against the violence of the oppressed in the ghettos without having first spoken clearly to the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, my own government. He said, there's something strangely inconsistent about a nation and a press that would praise you when you say, be nonviolent toward Sheriff Jim Clark, but will curse and damn you when you say, be nonviolent toward little brown Vietnamese children. There was something wrong with that press he said. 
actor and activist Danny Glover was in Memphis um, last year as well advocating media reform. I had come here for the media reform conference. Well, in November of 2001, after Glover criticized the Bush administration's use of military tribunals, the city of Modesto, California, almost disinvited him from its commemoration of Dr. King Day in 2002. Glover wondered then if King had lived, would he have been welcome at his own birthday celebration? <laughs> It is very important we put those two issues together, the poor and the war. And look at that today, 40 years later. It's something Gandhi also, in his wisdom, in his activism, in his deep nonviolent philosophy, he would say, we have to see the poor. We have to take them from obscurity, show the images, and made those connections that we rarely make when we're talking about the more than $700 billion bailout. What is the connection between that and funding this war, these wars in Iraq and Afghanistan? They are intimately connected. And who gets bailed out and who doesn't? In the last year, my brother and I have written our third book called Standing Up to the Madness, Ordinary Heroes in Extraordinary Times. And I think that what we're trying to do here is show what the hope is, that in times of great adversity, ordinary people in this country, they don't go looking for trouble, but when it comes to them, they stand up. Like, well, people you wouldn't want to meet in a dark alley if you're hijacking someone's civil liberties and they're the librarians of this country the librarians of this country. Uh, we have a chapter called Librarians Unbound, where we talk about the librarians of Connecticut who a few years ago, after the USA Patriot Act, um, well, had been passed right after September 11th, but then um, was being renewed. And two FBI agents came to the offices of the Library Connection, which is the computer system that connects the computers of the different libraries of Connecticut. George Christian was its executive director. He opened the door, surprised to see these agents, and they hand him an NSL. That's a national security letter. They have been given out over 150,000, probably 200,000 times in the last year. You're not allowed to talk about it. Maybe someone in this room has gotten it, but they hand it to George Christian. Once he opened it, it's like being exposed to radioactivity. You can't tell your boss, your colleague. You can't tell your partner. You can't tell anyone you have received this on pain of five years in prison. And he reads it quickly, and it says he has to hand over information about who has used the internet in a library system on a certain day at a certain time. And he looked up at the agents, and he said, I believe this is unconstitutional. Whereupon the agents looked at him pityingly like a predator sizing up their prey, handed him their cards, and said, you get back to us. He closes the door, he crumples into a chair, this brave librarian says, oh my God, if I'm going to take on the whole U.S. government, I need at least four more librarians. <laughs> and so he calls, he calls a meeting of the executive committee of the Library Connection. He calls Peter Chase, who's executive director of the Plainville Library in Connecticut. He had just joined a few weeks before they begged him. They said they'd give him the title of vice president. It's a voluntary position. And he would serve for a year. They said, it will be easy. <laughs> before he knows it, he's got getting a call from George Christian. He says, we're having an emergency meeting of the Library Connection tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. Don't tell anyone where you're going, and I can't tell you what you're going to say. You can tell no one what you have done. <laughs> So Peter Chase is in the car the next morning, and he is racing over there and thinking, my God, what has happened? Did someone forget to return a library book? <laughs> Did someone misfile an adult book in the children's section? <laughs> and he shows up at the library connection offices. George Christian closes the door. The four of them are there with their pro bono law lawyer who makes a beeline out of there. She says, this is way over my head, as he exposes them all to this national security letter. She says, you need the ACLU. And they do take on the ACLU, and they take on the whole U.S. government. They uh, sue the U.S. government over the USA Patriot Act. They immediately lose their names. They're John Doe, Connecticut, versus um, uh, the USA Patriot Act. And their case goes to court in the Bridgeport Court in Connecticut. They're not allowed in the courtroom. Um, it's not, you're not allowed to know who they are. And they go into the Hartford Court a couple 
hours away, and they are locked in a closet. It, no one was more surprised than the security guard who locked them in the closet because he said he'd never locked librarians in a closet before. <laughs> but in this closet was a closed circuit TV that's looking through at the Bridgeport courtroom over the shoulder of the judge. And what warmed their hearts, these librarians in the closet, <laughs> were the fact that the courtroom was packed with librarians from all over the country there in solidarity with them. Um, then the government forgot to redact some of the documents they released, and Peter Chase's name came out into the New York Times, and I think it was AP, Associated Press, called his house. You know, he'd never told his family about what was going on. This kid answers, and this kid runs out when he's coming from the library. And he says, Dad, uh, the reporters are calling, and they're saying something about this court case in the U.S. government, and Peter Chase says, Son, you never got that call, and you are never to talk about it. And his son looks in and says, Dad, are you involved with drugs? <laughs> and he calls up his lawyer and he says, you're not going to believe this. He says, um, he says, here we've kept our name secret all this time. And the government releases my name. And he says, and the reporters are calling. And there's silence at the other end of the line. The lawyer's not laughing. He says, Peter, you should leave the house now. It doesn't matter if the reporters called you or you called them. It doesn't matter what you said because he said, I was just silent on the line. What matters is that they'll see that there was a connection, that you're talking to a reporter. Just leave the house now and don't stay in one place more than one night. He says, what? And so these librarians are now gagged, muzzled, and on the run. <laughs> anyway, ultimately, um, they lose their case. But as soon as the USA Patriot Act is renewed, they would have testified before Congress against it. As soon as it's renewed, um, the gag is lifted on them. And they're the only four people who can talk about having been served with a national security letter. Um, if you have any thoughts about why they would have done this, the fact that they now can talk about this once the USA Patriot Act was renewed. These are people who are standing up. They're the freedom fighters of our time. And I don't know why Kent, Connecticut is such a hotbed of dissidents, but well, we did another story, a chapter on voices in conflict, the high school kids of Wilton, Connecticut, who dare to do a play about war, taking the words of soldiers written back to the United States or soldiers who have just spoken about their experiences, and they sort of piece them together, and they're doing their annual play, and the principal comes in and says, you can, you know, make your costumes, you can do your set, but you're not going to perform this on the Wilton High stage. And they say, why not? We do a play every year. This is too controversial. And they argue, and they um, plead with him, they beg him. He says, that ship has sailed. And that sails them right onto the New York stage, because theaters in New York hear about the censorship. And... Uh, they invite the kids to perform at the Culture Project at the New York Public Theater. And what was most moving at the New York Public Theater is that in the audience of New York theater goers, I mean, here these kids are doing something actors dream of all their lives to perform on the New York stage, and in the audience are some of the soldiers whose words they are traumatizing. These kids stood up, and what an education that they got. Interestingly, when the story got very big and the New York Times did a piece on it, Ira Levin wrote a letter to the Times that got published. He's a playwright, an author. Um, he just died a few months ago. He wrote The Stepford Wives, and he wrote that he grew up in Wilton, Connecticut. And the Stepford Wives was based on his experience there. <laughs> he congratulated the kids for not being Stepfordized. <laughs> and then we write about the global warming scientists who thought they were just doing their job. The leading one is Jim Hansen, right? The climatologist who was the head of the NASA Institute for Space Studies. Um, Goddard Institute for Space Studies at NASA. And at the end of 2005, he comes out with a report that says this year has been the warmest year in a century. And the Bush administration decides global warming is not the problem. The problem is Jim Hansen. Now here, the administration has been vacuuming the words global warming off of government websites. You see on television, the networks will do um, extreme weather, severe weather. Each network has a different name for it but spending more and more time with the newscast talking about this, which they actually should, it's extreme. What about including in these weather reports global warming, putting those two words together? And that's what Jim Hansen dared to do. And so 
Basically, they sicked a 24-year-old kid named George Deutsch on him to be his handler, his political handler, would decide who he would talk to in the media, who he would, how his reports would get out. These are taxpayer-funded reports. These are taxpayer-funded scientists. And this kid, and what was his claim to fame, the kid? He served as an intern in the Bush-Cheney War Room of 2004. Ultimately, he was forced out because he lied on his resume. He said he graduated from Texas A&M, but he had just taken a few classes. Um, and so we talk about the global warming scientists who go to Congress and dare to speak out. And then we, take, we have a chapter on psychologists in denial. This is an amazing story of the largest association of psychologists in the world, the American Psychological Association. Are any of you psychologists? Or no one? You don't have to answer that. Um, 150,000 psychologists um, are part of this association. Most join just to get their insurance. And the American Psychiatric Association, American Medical Association, have banned their members from participating in coercive interrogations at places like Bagram and Guantanamo and Abu Ghraib, but not the American Psychological Association. They are carefully or intimately commingled with the military, large group of military psychologists. And they will not pass, they would not pass a ban against involvement in interrogations. And President Bush had said they would not do these interrogations if they did not have medical supervision. So if the APA said no, it would have made it very difficult for the Bush administration to move forward with what they did. And so this group of dissident psychologists took on their own association, and they tried to pass a resolution against coercive interrogations. They did not succeed. The leadership beat them down. But this year, these brave psychologists figured out a way through the bylaws to introduce a referendum that would not pass through the leadership that all the psychologists would vote on. Just in the last few weeks, they were overwhelmingly supported in a vote that got more votes than anything in their history. And they have now passed this referendum that says no to participating in coercive interrogations. It's taken years. It will be an incredibly dark chapter in the history of the American Psychological Association. And a new president has just written a letter to President Bush saying their members can't participate. And the, the election for the next president is taking place as we speak right now. And the leading dissident, the leading psychoanalyst against torture, is the leading vote-getter um, uh, so far he has been. We'll see what happens if he actually becomes president of the APA. He got the most nominating votes. We begin the book with the story of Rosa Parks, and then I'll end with these two stories. Now, you might wonder why Rosa Parks. I mean, uh, of course, she was an extremely brave woman, did amazing things, really helped to launch the modern-day civil rights movement in this country, but her story is well known. But the media even gets this story wrong, right? Rosa Parks, December 1st, 1955, sits down on the bus in Montgomery, Alabama, in the front of the bus and refuses to get up uh, for a white passenger. And we all know that story. Uh, well, when Rosa Parks died, uh, Democracy Now! raced to Washington. She was the first African-American woman to lay in state in the Capitol Rotunda. Then they took her body to a Washington church, and thousands of people turned out to remember for her before the big funeral in Detroit. Um, thousands of people were there. Oprah Winfrey was there, Cicely Tyson inside, and thousands outside. They had these big loudspeakers. And we went to talk to people. Usually it's most interesting outside. I talked to a young woman who said, um, she had written to her professors that morning, I won't be in class, I'm going to get an education. Uh, and she came to the memorial service. I talked to a 91-year-old woman who was off by the road, and I asked her why she was there. She said, I sat down on the bus 14 years before Rosa Parks, not in the South, but in the North, in Massachusetts. She said, I was clutching my book, acting like I was reading it, and the bus driver came and said, get to the back of the bus, and I refused. And, you know, a number of women had sat down on the bus in Montgomery before Rosa. And in fact, Rosa had sat down before Rosa sat down December 1st, 1955, in the front of the bus. But this was the magic moment. And you never know when that moment will come, which is why what you do today is so important. 
Now, how the media got it wrong when they talked about Rose after she, after she died is they said she was a tired seamstress. She was no troublemaker. Rosa Parks was a first-class troublemaker. <laughs> right, Rosa Parks was the secretary of the local NAACP. She worked with Edie Nixon. He was president. He came out of radical labor politics. They had been challenging the racist laws of the South for years. She had gone to the Highlander Center, as Dr. King had done, and she was working black and white together to strategize against changing America, about to ch strategize to change America. She knew exactly what she was doing when she sat down on that bus. That night, Joanne Robinson, her friend, mimeographed 35,000 uh, mimeographs um, to begin the Montgomery bus boycott. And a few days later, December 5th, 1955, the Montgomery Improvement Association had their meeting. Well, thank you. Thank you. Had their meeting, and they chose as their leader to lead the boycott a young minister who had just come into town, the young Dr. Martin Luther King. Rosa Parks helped to launch Dr. Martin Luther King. The media denigrates activists. But what could be more noble than dedicating your life to making the world a better place? And that was certainly what Rosa Parks was, certainly what Dr. King was. And the media 40 years later, 50 years later, continues to do that. But what is going to change the direction of this country? You. You all together. That magic moment, you don't know when it'll come. But if you help to shape the foundation, which is what I think you're doing here now, when that moment comes, you will help determine the course of history.